Hello, I'm Luke Arnold and I love throwing parties. As an actor, I've been really lucky to travel to a bunch of amazing places and work with so many incredible, creative, charismatic people and I just love bringing a bunch of them together to bask in each other's glory. So that's what we're doing today. The excuse for this little get together is that I put out a couple of books this year. The Last Smile in Sunder City and its recently released sequel, Dead Man in a Ditch. These books follow a man for hire named Fetch Phillips. And rather than have me introduce him to you, I thought the cast of Black Sails might do a better job. Enjoy. some good, she'd said. Well, I tried, hadn't I? Well, I tried, hadn't I? Hadn't I? Every case of my career had been tiresome and ultimately pointless. Like when Mrs. Habit hired me to find her missing dog. Two weeks of work, three broken bones, and the old bat died before I could collect my pay. Leaving a blind and incontinent poodle in my care for two months. Just long enough for me to fall in love with a damn mud before he also kicked the big one. Rest in peace, Pompo. Rest in peace, Pompo. Rest in peace, Pompo. Rest in peace, Pompo. Then there was my short lived stint as Aaron King's bodyguard. Paid in full. Not a bruise on my body. But listening to that rich fall. Whine about his inheritance was four, four and a half days of agony. I'm still picking his complaints out of my ears with tweezers. Still picking his complaints out of my ears with tweezers. I'm still picking his complaints out of my ears with tweezers. After a string of similarly useless jobs. So I was in my office, half asleep, three quarters drunk, and all out of coffee. That was almost enough. The coffee. The coffee. Just enough reason to stop the whole stupid game for good. I stood up from my desk. Open the door. Not the first door. Not the first door. The, the first door of my office is the one with a little glass window that reads Fetch Phillips, man for hire. Fetch Phillips, man for hire. Fetch Phillips, man for hire. And leads through to the waiting room. Into the hall. No, I open the second door. I open the second door. The one that leads to... To nothing but a patch of empty air. Five floors above Main Street. The door had been used by the previous owner. But I'd never stepped out of it myself. Not yet, anyway. Not yet, anyway. Not yet, anyway. Not yet, anyway. The autumn wind slapped my cheeks as I dangled my toes off the edge. I looked down at Sunder City. Six years since it fell apart. Six years of stumbling around, hoping I would trip over some way to make up for all those stupid mistakes. Why did she ever think I could make a damn bit of difference? Ring! The candlestick phone rattled its bells like a beggar asking for change. I watched, wondering whether it would be more trouble to answer it or to eat it. Ring. 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 Hello? Am I speaking to Mr. Phillips? You are. This is Principal Simon Burbage of Ridge Rock Academy. Would you be free to drop by this afternoon? I believe I'm in need of your assistance. I knew the address. But he spelled it out anyway. Our meeting would be after school. Once the kids had gone home. But he wanted me to arrive a little earlier. If possible, come over at half past two. There's a presentation you might be interested in. I agreed to the earlier time and the line went dead. The wind. He slapped my face again. This time, I allowed the cold air into my lungs and pushed out the night. My eyelids scraped open. My blood began to thaw. I rubbed my hand across my face and it was rough, rough and dry like a slab of salted meat. A client. A case. One that might, might actually mean something. Might actually mean something. It might actually mean something. I grabbed my wallet, lighter, brass knuckles, and a knife. 
And I kicked the second door closed. And I kicked the second door closed. And I kicked the second door closed. <clears throat> Thank you to the incomparable cast of Black Sails. Everyone who has jumped on board the Sunder City Spectacular has just been so insanely generous. We're going to be reading a few more pieces from The Last Smile today, as well as a brand new scene written specially for this event. But first, we should make sure everyone's on the same page. So, six years before our story begins, an event known as the Coda killed the magic of the world. Dragons fell from the sky, elves aged centuries and seconds, wizards can no longer do spells. Fetch Phillips is wracked with guilt over the part he played in this tragedy. So now he works on the streets of Sunder City, helping out ex-magical creatures, and just trying to do a little bit of good in this broken world. We're going to read a scene now where another human comes to fetch his door to hire his services, and I've invited a very special guest to help me out. I used to watch Kyle Bossman every week when he presented his unique take on video games with his cult hit, The Final Bossman. But it was when he was one of the easy allies that I finally got to meet him. In 2019, Kyle made Box Peak. A paper puppet anime that he wrote, drew, directed, animated, edited, I mean, he did the whole thing in his apartment, and I was stoked that he asked me to play the role of Bronze Fang. You've got a lifelong fan. Now he's out on his own, streaming games and concocting his next incredible creation. Welcome to Sunder City, Kyle Bossman. Thanks for having me here in Sunder City. <laughs> Dude, thank you for coming and doing this. We're going to read a scene from the first book. Mm -hmm. For anyone who may not have read it, this is a scene where um, uh, someone comes to Fetch Phillips's office asking to hire him on a job. He's not the kind of guy that Fetch would like to take a job from. Um, so thanks very much, Kyle, for coming in uh, reading this scene with me. I do not look the part today. I have to... <laughs> look like I'm like I'm a well-to-do man and sound like I'm well-to-do man so I just got to get in the right state of mind for sure take a second to get into wherever wherever this guy fits for you today it starts with a yoo-hoo man it starts with a yoo-hoo <laughs> yoo-hoo's tough yoo-hoo's tough because yeah. like, I did this in the audiobook I, I'm not even quite convinced I did yeah. it with this guy okay I once had holy dooly in my in the first film I did I was which is an Aussie slang that I it haunted me the whole shoot. How'd you do it? How'd you do a hooli dooly? I think it was an excited hooli dooly. So I think it was, <laughs> oh no, no, it was a nervous. I realized I'm late for a, for a footy match. I was like, hooli uh -huh. dooly, I'm late for the game. <laughs> <laughs> hooli dooly, I'm late for the game. All right, from hooli dooly to you who. Mm -hmm. I got back to the office and was downing a glass of strong and brown when I heard a knock and an immediately grating yo -ho. Standing in the doorway was a well-groomed man in a pinstripe suit and fedora with no tie. Without being invited, he walked in and took a seat. He spoke like he was the host of a morning radio show, and I already wished I could turn down the volume. Good afternoon, Mr. Phillips. I'm glad I caught you at home. He crossed his legs to show off his colorful socks, and looked around my room like he was a tourist in an exhibition. Oh my! He marveled, pointing at the door behind me. You still have your angel door. How quaint. I had mine plastered over as soon as the coda happened. No flying creatures ringing the doorbell these days, right? I was tempted to open it up and show him just how useful the second door could be. Thirsty? I asked, holding up the bottle. Are those flies in there. I held the bottle up to the light and sure enough there were a bunch of little critters sprinkled on the surface. I don't think they're flies, I said. Well, what are they? Drunk. <laughs> he laughed too loudly. <laughs> he thought he was here for a show. I discovered your name in the newspaper, he said, one hand stroking the air. I have a job that I believe you would be perfect for. 
He whipped a shiny business card out of his pocket and pushed it across the desk. I didn't even look at it. I politely decline. What? Why? I'm busy. You don't even know what the job is. I don't need to. I don't work for humans. He raised an overplucked eyebrow. Well, that's quite racist. Aren't you? Human. Yeah, that's even stranger. Is it? At least listen to what I'm offering you. Okay, but I won't do it. I poured another shot, heavy on the critters. Look, my house has been taken over. These blasted dwarves have broken into my property and are refusing to leave. Where is this place? East 3rd Street, Steel District. Right. So I was all set to rent it out to another family and then start making my investment back. Now I'm losing money and the police won't do anything about it. Why do you think that is? Because the police are all damn magum. That's why I came to you. I poured another shot. Maybe it's because they see what you are. And what am I? A parasite. <laughs> he snorted. Careful. I have a lot of money, and if you want to get your hands on some of it, you'd better learn some manners. I picked the dead bug off the end of my tongue and wiped it on the desk. Let me guess what happened here. When the steel mill closed and the dwarves lost their jobs, they couldn't pay their mortgage. But the bank was in no rush to kick them out. What were they going to do with another empty street? They were happy to give the dwarves some time to find new employment till you offered to snatch up the properties at a discounted price. How many did you buy? He was proud to say it. Fifteen. Wow. You got a lot of kids? He held my eyes but didn't bother answering. Nah, I didn't think so. You offered a bunch of dirty cash to the bank, so they decided to move on the foreclosures. Now you want to rent those houses out, but the dwarves don't want to go, and the cops won't help you because they think you're a crook and they're right. Now you want to give me some of that dirty money to fix your problem, but I hate you even more than the cops do. I didn't come here to be insulted. Then you should have left when I told you. Now get out of here before I do more than call you names. He stood up, but didn't want to leave. You think it's charming? This drunken crusader routine? You're a joke. That was obvious from the moment I came in. I just thought you were in on the gag. He thought he'd won and I let him. My next answer would have come from my fist and I had a bad enough reputation without punching potential clients in the face. I listened to his footsteps on the stairs and finished the bottle, straining it through my teeth. Outside my window, Sundown was signaling the creatures of the street to change shifts. The peddlers and pickpockets were calling it a day as the pimps and dealers took over. There was a hangover on the horizon, along with something else. Something sort of stupid. That's a good line. Thank you, Kyle Bussman! <laughs> I felt I was a little cartoonish, and the, the accent wasn't consistent, but it was fun to do, for sure. Thank you so much again. Uh, it's just a real pleasure mm -hmm. to kind of work with you and have you bring my words to life and um, hope we get to do more of this at some time. Absolutely. Good luck with the launch of the new book, man. Cheers. Thank you. See ya. The Last Smile in Sunder City has been translated into Italian, German, and will soon be coming out in Spanish and Portuguese. Collect the whole set today. At the beginning of this year, we launched The Last Mile in Sunder City at a bar in Sydney, with Toby Schmitz and Tim Minchin coming up on stage to read a piece with me. I didn't really focus on filming it because I thought we'd be doing heaps of live events and I wanted to keep them kind of special and in the moment. But with things being the way they are, here's a little glimpse of these two legends bringing my words to life. He was holding out a lamp and was better dressed than anyone I'd seen in Sunder for years. Expensive velvet garments in charcoal and blue with a deep purple cape that fell over his shoulders. He had painted nails, clean boots, and two thin blades strapped to his belt. Hello, Mr. Phillips. 
I took a long enough pause to see that his weapons weren't drawn before I collapsed back and covered my privates with a sheet. I'd reopened the scars on my arm and lip, and fresh blood dripped onto the bed. It seems you've been learning some lessons. He continued. I believe your schooling may not be over for the- Is that a cape? <laughs> he stopped mid-word with his pretty little mouth hanging open. What? Are you wearing a cape? <laughs> yes. Who the hell wears a goddamn cape? <laughs> what are you? I have been sent Eat by- a dick. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse, excuse you. Uh, I don't know why I should. You break into my place in the middle of the night and wake me up in my birthday suit. There's a thing called business hours. It's exactly your business that I've come to talk about. Okay, then business hours it is. Come back after midday. Wear something sensible. I rolled over and showed him my ass. <laughs> Mr. Phillips. The little shit was getting really agitated now. I'm going to want to hear what I have to say. Go practice your trapeze act. Fly boy, before I make you eat your outfit. The toilet paper fell out of my nose while I talked, so I shoved the crimson plugs back in. Mr. Phillips, I bring with you a message on behalf of the League of Vampires, the mighty protectors of the weak and bringers of justice. It has come to our attention Were you that- you a vampire? I didn't even roll over. It has come to our attention that- You're just a messenger, right? That's what you said? I come on behalf of the League of- You're not a vampire. I am not. Then don't uh, say our attention. It has come to their attention. <laughs> it's not talking for so long, I must fall back to sleep. <laughs> it has come to their attention that you have been investigating the disappearance of a member of the blood race. We have been watching- They have. He sighed. <laughs> they have been watching you for some time and have allowed your investigation to continue because they had faith that your interests and theirs were the same. Now they fear that your lack of care is more of a danger to their cause than a benefit. You will stop your investigation. You will not mention the blood race. You will abandon your meager attempt to find Mr. Rye or there will be consequences. And now, I'd like to present a non-canon Fetch Phillips adventure starring an old friend. I ran into my office with the leather-wrapped bundle in my arms. I shouldn't have taken it. I knew that now. But it was too late to try and put it back. I opened the top drawer of my desk, put the bundle inside, closed it, and collapsed on the chair. I had just enough time to convince myself that I wasn't followed before someone kicked my door in. And it over. I was overcome by a strange sensation, as if I could hear the squeals of 10,000 women echoing around the world. Give me the treasure, he continued, before it gets ugly. Getting ugly wouldn't come easy to the fellow. He'd probably run 10 miles that morning. 15. He'd probably run 15 miles that morning. I know that sounds crazy. With anyone else, it would be. But not him. There was something about him that made you believe he could do anything in the world, except maybe write his own name. Don't make me repeat myself. Wouldn't dream of it. You sound like you're losing your voice already. You want a lozenge? I want the treasure. And which treasure is that? True love? A place to call home? friends we made along the way. The treasure you stole from my ship. You might be aware that Sunder City isn't close to any ocean, so it makes no sense that this man's ship would be anywhere near my office. At the time, I thought that too. But when a man brandishing a sword with pectorals bigger than your head tells you that he has a ship nearby, you don't argue with him unless you're convinced that your mouth has too many teeth in it. I'm Charles Vane of the Ranger. Now. Of the Ranger? What does that mean? Is that like the land you're from? No, it's uh... Or is that your dad? My people around here, they'd say, Charles, son of Ranger. You know, if you want to fit in. It's my ship. Oh, right. That's cute. Hand over the treasure, or I'll take it back, along with your head. Do you really do that? Cut off heads? Oh, uh, yeah, once. Uh, it's not as easy as you'd think it'd be. You expect one clean slice, but there's all sinew and bone and all kinds of shit. It's pretty tough. Especially if you don't sharpen your sword every day, which uh, I don't. 
Uh, this pirating thing sounds like a lot of work. It's a living. You meet some interesting people. Uh, I guess the dames, I bet. Oh, that's a touchy subject. Sorry. Suddenly he grabbed the desk and pushed it back, slamming me into the wall and pinning me there. Last warning. The treasure. Or your life. I knew what my life was worth, and the treasure was the better deal. But if he killed me, I'd lose the prize anyway, so I might as well give him what he wanted. It's in the top drawer. Get it out, then. Well, you're currently forcing the top drawer between two of my ribs. Could I get a little space? Oh, yeah, sorry. The captain pulled back the desk and I retrieved the bundle and handed it over. He nodded. He wasn't a man of many words and he appeared to have used up his quota for the day. He tossed the bundle back and forth between his hands, weighing something up in his mind. Is there anything else I can get you? There's a bar down the road with a good rum selection. His eyes turned to slits. It was feeding time at the zoo and I'd just been dropped into the lion's cage. You snuck onto my ship. Stole something that belonged to me. And you did it so badly that people saw you getting away. I have a reputation to uphold. My captaincy depends on it. So, let me tell you what happens next. I wondered what would be more embarrassing, trying to fight him or trying to flee. Neither plan would last very long, I was sure about that. He took a step forward and raised his sword. Then there were footsteps on the stairs, and a mustachioed man with a sweaty face appeared in the door. Chaz, I think we should get going. We seem to be in some kind of fantastical city. Anne picked a fight with a snake person, and I angered a one-eyed fellow who... Not like he'd lost one eye, like he just has one eye in the middle of his head, like some... Anyway, it's fucking freezing, the food is shit, and I'm not convinced that we haven't all smoked too much opium and are slowly dying on the floor of the brothel, so I'd really love to get out of here. Now. He disappeared. The captain gave a small, almost imperceptible smile and sheathed his sword. I guess there's not enough time to cut off your head after all. If only I'd sharpen my sword. He walked out and went downstairs. I could hear the other one talking all the way up Main Street, heading back to their ship and off on some other adventure. I try not to think about them too often. When I do, it makes my office feel small and the air of the city seems stale. I'm sure it's not for everyone, a life on the seas, but for those that can manage it, it sure must be something special. Zach McGowan and Toby Schmitz, everyone! Yeah. Uh, it must be something special. Does anyone have a logic? It was good. It was good to hear Vane and Rackham again. Tobes, I forgot that you were just the funniest person that ever walked the earth. <laughs> sure. sure. Look at the gags Luke he just wrote for him. Oh no, definitely. There's not up there with Steinberg. Give Toby Schmidt anything and he'll make it gold. <laughs> the bits where um, um, Chaz backs down. Like, because he can. He's like, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, no, but please go. I will kill you soon. But if, if you need a little more breathing room, then, <laughs> then take no, it. Yeah, I do think writing sorry for Charles Vane is maybe not good canon black sales. I don't know if he ever said sorry in the uh, these seasons of the show. I, I don't think I ever did, actually. I don't, I'm not sure. I, I was like, wait, how do you pronounce sorry in that accent? I'm like, <laughs> I've never, never said that before. If he does, he's sorry. feeling the word out or using it ironically. Yeah. How does it feel to say this word? I'll try anything once. Sorry. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for joining me and reviving a vein and Rackham for me here today. That was just <laughs> the most fun. Oh, it's getting, we're getting more rackham -y right now. Oh. I, I love hanging out with Toby Schmitz, but I do, and I do miss a bit of Jack Rackham sometimes, though. Hold on, I can't let this happen oh, without. Uh, I'm going to yes. have to do some hairstyles. Yeah. Yeah, now that we've finished the recording, we can actually get into no, character. No, no, Thank no, you no. so much, gentlemen. That was such a joy. Thank you for coming to Sunder City. And hopefully we get to do this in reality sometime soon. Cheers. 
Damn straight. And there we go. That is part one. Thank you to everyone who helped me out with the Sunder City Spectacular, the cast from Black Sails, Kyle, Tim, Toby, and Zach. This has been really special and there is more to come. If this has inspired you to buy my books, can I recommend that you think about getting them from your local independent bookstore? This has been a really tough year for local bookstores and this would be a really cool way to support them as well as me. If they don't have it in stock, I'm sure they'll be happy to order one in for you. And make sure you come back for part two when I'll be reading parts from Dead Man in a Ditch with a whole new cast of amazing, talented, beautiful, generous people. So I'll see you then. Thank you for watching. Cheers. <laughs>